Hi, today I'm going to be showing off the firmware I've developed to replace the stock firmware on the V6 and V7 Dyson vacuums. Here I have a uh, V7 and it has a SV11 model number, depending on which one you want to go off of. And this is running the firmware I've developed that replaces the stock version. And the main benefit of this is that it doesn't actually lock you out if the cells go too far out of balance. It will keep them within a safe operating range, but it doesn't actually brick itself. So, just to show you that it works, there's that. But let me take this off, and so then I can actually show you some of the different LED codes and features that are built in without the noise of the vacuum. Now, to show off some of the features on the firmware, there's a bunch of different LED codes that are built in. And so, when it's just idle, the output's not on, and it's not charging, it's just solid green. So right now, the battery is in a, what I call a sleep state, where the actual power of the microcontroller is completely turned off, and it's in its lowest power state. So when you either connect the charger or you pull the trigger, assuming the read switch is satisfied, it will immediately turn on power to the microcontroller. And so if we were just using the vacuum, we'd pull the trigger. If the magnet was in the right spot, that magnet's a little touchy. What you'll see, so you push the button, you'll see a red, green, blue flash. That just means you're using my custom firmware. You're not using the boring factory firmware. To turn it on, pull the trigger, red, green, blue flash, you're on. Solid blue, output enabled, assuming you're holding down the trigger. When you release it, you'll see you get green blinks. You've got three green blinks. We do it again, turn it on, release, one, two, three. That roughly indicates the level of battery remaining. It's not a great indication because we're just going off of the cell voltage and on lithium ion cells, it's pretty flat for most of the discharge curve of the battery. So it's not great, but it is there. All right, I just have a stock charger here and we don't actually, you only need the magnet for the switch to work. You don't need the magnet for the charger to work. Not that it matters because this will be in the vacuum the whole time. When you connect the charger, it will wake up. But what you'll see there is that we're green, idle. When you connect the charger, you'll get yellow flash. One yellow flash means that our cells are roughly 50 millivolts out of balance. And that yellow flash will show when you connect and disconnect the charger. And so that gives you some idea of how out of balance the cells inside of here actually are. So if we were, it rounds, so if we were 20 millivolts out of balance, we wouldn't get any flashes. If we were 50 to probably, I think, 74, right, 25 to 74, it would be one flash for roughly 50 millivolts. And you know, 220 millivolts out of balance would give you four flashes, 50 millivolts per flash. And you'll see when the LED is off, that means it went to sleep. It goes to sleep after about 30 seconds of no activity. We connect, one, flat, one yellow flash, and now it's solid blue. The solid blue, when we had the when we're using the trigger, meant the output's on. When you have the charger connected, solid blue means the charging is active. So it's charging the cells right now. I won't be able to show this on camera, but what'll happen is once the highest voltage cell reaches two point I'm sorry, four point two volts, this will go to a white color. It will then wait seventy seconds and then it will go back to charging it also times how long it takes from when the charging starts to when the maximum cell voltage reaches 4.2 volts and when it takes about less than 10 seconds it considers it charging complete and then it will go to the green idle state and then from there after 30 seconds it would turn off one of the other things that you can do is if you 
pull the trigger, so of course the vacuum is going to turn on, and then you connect the charger while holding the trigger down. You'll get that. And so what that is, the white flash, or could be flashes, is the firmware version. So in that example, we got one white flash, so version one. You'll see how we got one yellow flash. That was the usual, you connected the charger, so one yellow flash means my cells are about 50 millivolts out of balance. And then you saw it went to charging. So just to show that one more time, if I'm holding down the trigger, so output's on, I connect the charger, one white flash, version one, one yellow flash, 50 millivolts out of balance, solid blue, now it's charging. And of course, once the charger's connected, trigger doesn't do anything. The charger overrides it. And then of course, we just disconnect, you get your out of balance indicator again. And so to remove the battery on one of these, there are three screws. There is one right there, and then there are two, normally two here at the bottom. I actually lost one. So we're just gonna remove this. And these might be posi drive, but you could probably get a Phillips to work too. Once you've undone the three screws that you'll have on yours, the battery will just slide out of the bottom like this. And for now, I'm going to get rid of the vacuum. One thing I'll actually note is that the V7 vacuums have a hidden magnet. inside of the plastic, right? You can kind of see what that's sticking to. And that triggers a reed switch that is on the PCB inside the battery. And so for that reason, if we push the button here, nothing happens because there's nothing triggering that reed switch. So if I put it in the vacuum, then it works. And the only thing on the vacuum here is that there's only two contacts. You see if I even sharpied on here, so I'll mix them up. Plus, minus. All the smarts of this, barring the motor controller, uh, all the smarts of it are actually in the battery here. When you pull the trigger, all you're actually doing is pushing a little red lever in there that actually just pushes the button on the battery. So the battery is kind of the brains of the operation. So, you push the button and the battery is what decides if it's going to give you access to power or not. And just to kind of show off the read switch, it doesn't work now, but if you get a magnet in the right spot, you'll see it works. Alright, I'm going to show how to try and open one of these. These are fairly difficult to open but hopefully the process should come across. This is an SV04, it's for an SV04 vacuum uh, V6. So for starters, there is one screw there that we'll remove. And that, I'm using a T9 bit. These are held together by a number of plastic clips Here's a disassembled example. You can see these clips. So that means we have a lot of prying in store for us. So what I have here is just a metal spudger that I found to work best. And then I've cut up some old like reward cards. These are to make some plastic spacers so that as I pry around here, I can insert these to keep the clips from reclipping themselves. So, I find it's easiest to start here on the bottom. So, and there's almost no way to do this without messing up the plastic. It's never going to look quite the same. These were definitely not designed to be opened. Alright, 
that one in there. The bottom's the easy part. So I've got this under here. I can usually slide this to get it under the clip there. Now I can use that as a starting point to get to the next one. So now we have the bottom two spacers done. Now I'll do the sides. And you'll see occasionally I'm pulling these apart just to try and get any amount of gap in there that I can. On the bottom you can use almost any kind of spacer. You'll need some narrower ones for the sides and some even narrower ones for those clips. So on this, and I'm not sure you could do this with a plastic spudger. This is really tough. that one. We got that one and you can see it's starting to come apart a little bit. Now, by the way, these are going under this short piece. Why don't we try for this one. These are probably the hardest ones. Sometimes you can get the shim under, but not quite under the plastic, but not under the clip itself. Uh, this is the plastic will never be the same. Not getting any slack in this one. I'm not quite sure this one went very well. usually use this one, the spudger, for this, but oh, I worked on that side. You can see we actually have a gap there now. Okay, I'm going to take the risk and not put the shim in there. Usually that doesn't work out very well. Actually, I'm going to try again. Let's try this one again. I've done like at least five of these. If you haven't done this before, I would easily plan on at least 15 to 30 minutes. You want to get some luck with this one again? Yeah. Okay, all right. So I didn't have any luck getting the shims on the top here, but I was able to still unclip the clips and you can tell because it's we've actually got a gap here now and finally there are actually two easy ones under here so usually there we go That will happen almost every time, <laughs> so don't lose that. Now we can take our shims out. Now I want to be gentle here because there are some wires where contained in this end section there's the charging port, there's also a switch for the button. The charging port is almost in, 
it, it's almost impossible to non-destructively re remove. So I don't even bother anymore. The button can slide out, but what we'll do... Okay, we've got a little bit of slack there now. So... The only thing holding the battery into this plastic shell is actually the light pipe. There's a plastic light pipe piece that goes through the shell there and there. It is possible with enough prying to actually pry the outer plastic shell away around the light pipe to get it out. I only did that once. Now, a days, I've kind of given up non-destructively removing this. So what I'll do is on one side I will carefully, because this is a live battery, I will clip a channel out of the plastic shell itself. The light pipe is actually going to be able to slide out that way. And then on the other side, I will go with the usual prying method, because one side's easy to get out of the shell, but getting both out simultaneously is extremely hard. Alright. So you can kind of see we've got a little bit of a gap there, which usually means we're on our way. So now, with any luck, we freed it. This is just a plastic shell. This end piece I actually keep attached because you can probably see there's the charging port with the white and black wire going to it. And then we also have the button up here that's actuated. And the way this works is there's a spring and then this is the actual piece that sticks out of the battery. And then without the shell it's not well retained. But the way this works is when you push this button it actually unpresses the actual switch. Yeah, the switch is normally closed, so when the spring is pulling up on this button, the switch is pressed, and thus the circuit is actually open. It's very unintuitive, but it does work. All right, so now that we've removed this, we can see the sections that we're going to be connecting to. So what you can do, and I highly recommend using non-conductive tools for anything where you're actually like on the circuit board here because it's still, there's no way for us to disconnect this board without desoldering all these connections which is possible but a big pain which means we're working on something that's kind of live here. What you can do is just peel off this sealant. And it's not too difficult, but you will want to make sure that you're not prying any of the components because it would probably not be hard to also break off a capacitor or some of these teeny tiny resistors. So, now you can probably see what I was talking about, where we have our four contacts here, and we have our ground connection there. Those are what we're going to need to use for programming. To get started to connect this, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug this into the computer. And we should get the Windows Hover Connected sound. And got that connected. 
Now we're going to need a couple pieces of software. For start with, we're going to need the actual firmware we're going to be installing. So if you go to the GitHub repository and go over here to releases, and the latest release will show here. So we can click on that. We'll need to download the hex file. I'm just going to save that in our downloads. And I'm also going to download the source code zip so I can show you how we can also read the logging data for any errors that we end up with that occur while we're using the battery. It's not mandatory. So we've got our hex file and then we're also going to need the PickKit 3 standalone app. You can also do this with the actual MPLAB X development software. That's a much bigger program so if you're just programming this you only really need this and it's a lot smaller to download. So the way you get this, and I'll also include a link in the description, is you go to Tools and Resources, Develop, scroll down, MPLAB, Ecosystem, Downloads, Archive. I'll click on that, and then I'm going to scroll all the way down here. Pick it, Programmer, New Archives, and we're going to want this one. This is the latest version I'm aware of. This isn't supported anymore, but it's still work well for our Picket 3. So we'll go ahead and download this. Go ahead and show where it's downloaded. We'll extract it. You'll see there's three more zip archives inside. We need the setup. We'll extract this. And it'll give us these setup files. We'll run setup. And next, next, next. Agree, next, yes. Should be installed. And now in the start menu, you should have Picket 3. <laughs> I think this is actually a typo. It says V3.01. The site says 3.1. So, but that's the one you want. So now that we have that, we need to make sure it's detecting the pick kit properly. So you can see it says mine's in MP Lab mode. The pick kit can either be in the standalone programmer compatible mode or it can be in the MP Lab mode. And they're not compatible with each other. So we need to get this one into the correct mode for this. So let's go to tools, download an OS compatible. So we go to tools, download pick kit operating system. It'll take us straight into the folder where this comes with this program, so we just need to pick this hex file. Already tell us where it is. Hit open. See, it says downloading bootloader, and I'll go through a couple of these. And I'm running this in a virtual machine, so mine kind of does this failure thing sometimes. So I have to do check this. Now, since there's no operating system, Different message from before. We'll run this again. Now we'll put on the operating system. Now we'll do check communication. Now it's connected. You should be able to skip most of that whole check communication download process when you're not running in a virtual machine. But now we're connected. So what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to close this because. By the way, this happens all the time, just hit quit. I actually want to have this connected to the microcontroller before starting the program up because then it'll auto detect things if we're lucky. So to do that, using the wiring diagram, we're just going to get these connected. So I'm going to put these jumper wires into these the plated through holes on the circuit board. They won't go in all the way and we want to try and make as good of a connection as we can by kind of getting it in there and wiggling it around a little bit. You may have to also insert it and remove it a couple times and if there's any of this um, potting compound or uh, conformal coating in there you may need to push through it a little bit but We'll connect these in any order for now. Okay. 
these last couple holes don't go quite as far because there's some old plastic underneath the circuit board in the way. So we have those, looking at the wiring diagram, I'm just going to start here at pin 1, and that is VPP, which is the bottom most connection on the circuit board. Now we have VDD, which is connection fourth from the bottom. Now we need ground, which is the very top connection. Now we need ICSP DAT, which is third from the bottom. <laughs> These are always a little touchy. And then we need ICSP clock, which is second from the bottom. And Check it from the bottom going up. Connect this. Now, this is not the most reliable way, but it doesn't involve any soldering, so for one time programming, it may be the easiest way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a little bit of just tension on them, try and keep them pressed in that hole. I'm going to release the trigger, or the button, and Pull this off so you can see that LED. I have the light pipe removed, but you can see when I remove this, it lights up. So now the thing is awake. And so now you don't actually want it awake until you have all this connected. Now on the computer, we'll go over to the Pit Kit 3 program and open that up again. And if we're lucky, I think we are. You can see it's detected, it's mid-range, 1.8 volt, minimum configuration, pick it, or pick 16LF 1847. It's connected. Wonderful. And just to show you if it wasn't working right, I'm just going to close this. I will disconnect VPP and start this up again. And you'll see now it says no device found. If that happens, what you can do is check your connections. Check your connections. We'll apply a little bit of tension. Then go over to tools. Go to, sorry, go to device family, mid-range, 1.8 volt minimum. Power detected. Actually, it detected at that time. Great. You can also do check communication to have it retry. But this is what we want. It's pick the right device, pick device found. So now all we need to do is go to File, Import Hex, we'll go to our downloads. We'll find our hex file that we downloaded from the GitHub repository. Hit Open. And we'll hit Write. And we're done. Now I'm just going to remove these wires. You can see now we're getting much different LED codes. So you can see right now it's green, which means it's in an idle state. The output's not on, and the it's not charging. Obviously, when you pull the trigger on the vacuum. You get a red, green, blue flash, means you're running the fancy firmware, and when you release the trigger, you'll get those bat blink code on a scale of one to six, roughly how much battery is left. Five blinks. To reassemble these after you've worked on it, it's pretty much the opposite of disassembly. The only thing to keep in mind is you want to get these wires yeah, kind of gently tucked in there. Make sure this plastic plunger piece is there along with the spring because that's what keeps the switch depressed. And we'll gently kind of push that back in there. And then we'll take our 
other side of our casing and uh, push on the light pipe a little bit to get it started. Kind of make sure that's all going. And then a little bit of force. And we just put the screw back in. And you can see where that channel I cut, yeah, it's visible from the outside, but it's not too bad and it's a whole lot easier than prying it out otherwise. What I want to show is that there's also error codes that will be shown through the LED if there actually is an error. So we we'll do something, not something I would recommend you try, but we're going to directly short the terminals of the battery. Yeah, don't try at home. I do as I say, not as I do. So now that we have that, we have the magnet in place. We're gonna pull the trigger. we have an error. If you count, there's going to be 16 blink codes. It, you can count if you want to, but there's 16 blink codes, which means that stands for ISL brownout. And it's kind of a long story, there's more information on the forums, but essentially we didn't have enough current to trip the short circuit protection because that's set to 175 amps. And it needs to be because otherwise the vacuum won't start. Or we got nuisance trips. So it didn't trip that, but it draw, drew so much power that the supply rail to the ISL 94208 battery monitor chip dipped down enough that it reset itself, and it's kind of a long story. But we have our error, so let's remove this. And what if we want to know more about the error, or we don't remember what exact error we got, or we got multiple errors? We can use the PIC kit to read back the EEPROM data from the microcontroller and actually look at the log of errors. So rather than fiddle with these again, which you certainly can, just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to use the little pogo pin adapter not pretty when it works, that we can use to connect. So, and also have a magnet in here to trip the sensor. So what we'll do is we will connect this. I'm just gonna hold it. We'll release the trigger so it's turned on. On the computer, I'm just gonna go check communication to make sure we're still talking. Pick device found, great. I'll do read. Great. Now, in here you can see we have a bunch of hex data. This actually means something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click, select all, right click, copy. I'm going to put this into a notepad file. I just, what I did there is short keyboard shortcut that I have it, but same as right click, paste. What I'll do is we'll just save. And for now, I'm just going to put in downloads, we'll say EPROM dump.txt. Now, we are going to need Python in a second, but this is the reason we downloaded the whole source zip, is if we extract this inside of here, there's an EEPROM parsing tool, and that makes it much easier to interpret the data that's stored on the EEPROM, which is just a Python script. So we're going to need Python, so let's go grab that. Installed. Go ahead and do that. Close. Now we have Python installed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up back to a downloads folder, 
find that EEPROM dump text file. I'm just going to cut and I'm just going to move it into this EEPROM parsing tool folder just so it's a little easier to run. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift and I'm going to right click. And then you'll get this option open PowerShell window here. It's just the fastest way to get here. Make this smaller and make this scroll up. So now we just need to do, I'm going to do by just typing the first few characters and hit tab. Oops. Hit tab. Uh, try again. There we go. Hit tab until we get to the file we want, which is that eprom parsing tool.py. Do space, and we're just going to do the name of that text file and just choose for first few characters and hit tab until you get the one you need. And then we hit enter, and like magic, it tells us from our version, eh, it's assuming it's version one, uh, total runtime in seconds. It, there's no real time clock, so we don't know how much, what time happened in the real world, but we can track how long the output was enabled over like the life of the battery. And so ever since I've updated the firmware, we had the output on here for 21 seconds. And you can see that we had one error, meaning ISL brownout happened while the trigger was pulled, meaning output. If it was a charge it error, that would be charger here. And it happened at the very end of our 21.312 seconds. So this way you can get much more easily understandable data from EEPROM as far as what errors have happened and when. Let's hit enter close. And so that about does it as far as we've taken one of the batteries, we've taken the plastic shell off, I've showed you that then we can scrape the adhesive, not adhesive, scrape the conformal coating off of these five contacts. I showed you we've got the wiring diagram that we can use to connect our pit kit 3, 4, or clone to it. How to download the program from microchip, download the GitHub repository as well as the hex code, get that connected, download the firmware, as well as later if you ever needed to, you can look at your log of errors if you have any or trying to figure out what's going on. So. I hope this helps, and if you have any questions, just uh, you can either open an issue on GitHub or uh, I guess you can leave a comment. Thanks for watching.